Good day. So good to be here with you and thank you once more for inviting me into your homes or wherever you are, either listening or watching or doing both from this message that uh, God has brought for us today. And I thank you again for your, for your uh, kindness and your prayers too, and I pray for you as well. When we consider CNN.com Travel World or World Travel, they posted an article in 2021 evaluating 10 different countries and their uh, unique and distinctive foods. It was a fun article. It was filled with the yummy to the tummy pictures. Uh, got the juices salivating there. CNN.com World Travel, in their opinion, revealed the best foods of each of these 10 countries. For example, we have Greece with its gyros. I'm not sure if you know what that is, but what a gyro is simply is a pita bread folded in half filled with roast meat and a healthy dose of tzatziki sauce. That sounds delicious. We have Japan with its sushi and its uh, tempura. We have Spain, which has a churro and its wonderful sweet fried dough. France and the only France could do this, make something that's in your garden crawling on its belly delicious. The escargot and of course their baguette and with no bias whatsoever for those of you who know me. Uh, Italy with its pizza and the Italian style salami which is so delicious. And for me bar none the very best, the only place in the world to get a decent cup of coffee. But while we're on the topic of food, can I ask you, what is your go-to comfort food? You know the food that uh, soothes your cares and your sadnesses, or the food that brings a nice smile on your face? Is it, a, is it vanilla ice cream with a, a nice uh, dollop of chocolate syrup on it? Is it a slice of pizza, which I kind of tend to lean toward? Or is it a slice uh, of homemade bread fresh out of the oven with a generous amount of butter spread all over it? Still warm and, and well, just that, that sounds really good. Or is it simply, folks, sitting around the dinner table with your loved ones, uh, enjoying the time and every bite, enjoying every tantalizing morsel of your... You just fill in the blank there. Please turn now into your, in your Bibles or your apps, your iPads, to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to be reading verse 10 and then skipping down to verse 16 through the 20. So starting in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What, does the, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Now down to verse 16. Are you still so dull? Jesus answered them. That's, he was speaking to his disciples. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adulteries, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Uh, Lord, the blessed reading of your word. And we just ask, Lord, now as we look at, uh, at this, this particular sin that is so commonly found in our world and certainly in the church as well, the sin of uh, gossip, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to Temper our spirits and fill them with your grace and mercy as we consider those around us and even our own lives. And when we've been involved in gossip ourselves, and Lord, I just thank you that uh, you have a word to speak to us on that today. And we just commit to that to you and praise you and thank you that you uh, know what we need the most of all. And we just uh, lean in on that today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs 26, 22 says the word, words of a gossip are like choice morsels that go down to the inmost parts. Now you might be wondering, if you've been tracking with me, uh, what happened to 1 Timothy? We've been in 1 Timothy for a number of weeks. And you might ask, where does Proverbs 26, 22 come into the picture? Well, I want to remind us then of the context of 1 Timothy. First, false teachers and their false teaching had resulted in a variety, it seems, well, actually did, according to the letter, a variety of dysfunctions in the Ephesian church. Chapter 1 reveals 
uh, that false teachers were peddling, according to uh, Paul, myths and endless genealogies, which encouraged simply this, what Paul would say, controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, by, which is by faith. And it became more than speculations in the Ephesian church, according to Paul, for some had shipwrecked their faith in regard to their faith, have shipwrecked their faith. And later in his letter, Paul reminded Timothy that false teachers who had this unhealthy interest and controversies and quarrels produced only one kind of result. The Ephesian church, friends, was endemic with what Paul says, envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions. Paul, in a second letter to the Corinthian church, said, For I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, but you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling and jealousy and outburst of anger, factions, slanders, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. In another letter of Paul's, to the Roman church, he describes there in uh, chapter 1 the very depth and saturation that sin has impacted human nature in every which way. Since Adam and Eve sinned, and he said, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, deceit, and malice. They are gossips. And it goes on and on. You know, I was thinking about that, and it's interesting as Christians how we often view sin. We might not go to this right away, but it's inherently in us at times. And I was discussing this with Pastor David. For those of you who are watching this on, online, you don't know Pastor David. He's my associate here at Redwater Alliance. See, we tend to classify sin, don't we? We, we classify sin into big sins and into small sins. Small sins might include telling what is often called a white lie. And I suppose that's the opposite of a black lie. I'm not even sure what that all means, to be honest with you. We, in essence, what we do is put the full weight of Romans 1 in our biblical ar arrogance or deceit on the so-called big sins and not so much on the small sins. It seems more often than not when we consider uh, gossip that we classify gossip in the small sin category. A fellow by the name of Matt Mitchell and his article is a really good article um, called What is gossip? gossip Exposing Common and Dangerous Sin? A common and dangerous sin said, You don't want to be a gossip. There is no upside to being one. Gossips hurt neighbors, divide friends, and damage reputations and relationships. So for the rest of our time today, I'll be using Mitchell's outline so that we can dig a little deeper into this tantalizing sin called gossip. Now one of the characteristics of gossip is the ability to slip under the radar, to, be, uh, to slip under unnoticed. That is, it's easy for you and me then to slip into gossip mode. As Proverbs 26, 22 has highlighted for us, gossip can be as enjoyable and satisfying as a tantalizing bite of our favorite comfort food. And like that yummy bite, which goes deep into our stom stomach and then straight to our thighs or our waist, gossip gets down deep inside of us and straight into our hearts. But this begs the question, why? Why are we drawn to gossip? Why do we listen to gossip? Why do we gossip ourselves? I was thinking about that, and I, I thought of inter entertainment tonight for some reason. First thing that popped in my head, commonly known as E.T. And now E.T. Uh, claims to be the go-to news source regarding entertainment and celebrities. And I'm not here to argue against that. But absolutely and certainly, from time to time, without a doubt, speculations and gossip has found its way on E.T. Who doesn't want to know the secret lies of our favorite stars? But here's the point, folks. Here's the point. One reason we can easily slip into gossip mode is when we are bored. Think about that. Because there's nothing more tantalizing and exciting than some gossip to get us out of our boredom. 
How about this? Have you ever got, found out some information about someone that no one else knows? And you can't wait to tell someone. It just kind of drives you nuts. You've got to tell someone about it. When we think of the media, it's always chasing after the scoop. Always the scoop. To be the first to know something about something and get out the gate before their competitors. That's just their modus operandum. That is nothing wrong with that. But we feel proud to be the first to get out of the gate with new information about someone else, especially if it's a little tantalizing, a little scandalous, a little dangerous. How about this? Has anyone ever made you angry, really angry? Don't answer that question with a no, because then you would be lying. And in your anger, you desire the satisfaction of character assassinating someone by gossiping to someone else. What you're doing there is you're attacking your enemy, your perceived enemy, from a distance without even them knowing you are after them, without them even knowing you have them in your sights. So here we have boredom, pride, and anger. Certainly not a complete list for sure, but yet each of these on their own can lead us into gossip mode. And here's the scoop. Mitchell has this bang on. Friends, gossip is hard to recognize and easy to do. I'll repeat. Mitchell suggests that gossip is hard to recognize and easy to do. Of course, this being a message, and we're using the Bible, we ask the question, what does the Bible have to say about gospel? Well, I did a really a quick and not necessarily a thorough sur survey through the Bible, and I found, at the very least, 25 references that address the sin of gossip. But it's interesting to note that the Bible does not define the sin of gossip in those references. What the Bible does is describe gossip in action. After all, folks, if you think about it, the Bible is about real people in real history, in real life situations. So the Bible describes the action around gossip and the character of the people that are engaged in gossiping. In other words, the Bible uses the word gossip to describe the kind of person more than the kind of conversation or the method of conversation. And from our purposes, we're going to look at gossip from three different angles. One, bearing bad news. Two, behind someone's back. And three, out of a bad heart. So let's look at bearing bad news. As we said already, we know that gossip is hard to recognize and easy to do. No more so, friends, when uh, we have a tasty bit of bad news on someone. Some info on someone's sin or their shame. We go to Genesis chapter 37, and there we have the story of Joseph and his brothers. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's really a very, very noteworthy read, and I would advise you to. And in chapter 2, it informs us that Joseph had been tending the flocks with his brothers, and upon returning home, uh, we read... Joseph brought their father a bad report about them, about their, his brothers. Now, we don't know why or what happened there. Nevertheless, it seems that Joseph thought it would be necessary to bring a bad report to his father concerning his brothers. And uh, the question I have, if you know the story, is how did that work out for him? There's a lot of um, uh, bad boundaries in that relationship between father and sons. Um, but... It didn't turn out too well for Joseph. King David said, uh, My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die and his name perish? And his name perish. When one of them comes to me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander. Then he goes out and spreads it around. So here what is revealed to us is the sinister working of gossiping bad words that is not true. The sinister working of gossiping bad news. It's no longer gossip, it becomes slander. And the Bible uses the word phrase malicious talkers or the word malicious to describe one who slanders another. How about if the bad news is true of the other person? If it's true, it must not be gossip, right? Does gossip cease to be gossip then? Remember the bad report that Jesus brought to his father about his brothers. Or those who spoke falsely and ill will and slanderous against King David. 
We should ask ourselves some questions before we pass on a bad report about someone else. Is this story true? How do I know? Is this story mine to tell someone else? Or is it his or hers story to tell someone? Is this a story about bad news? God said to his people in Israel, in Leviticus, do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. Second one, behind the back. Have you ever heard someone say, so-and-so just stabbed me in the back? Sometimes they describe the size of the knife. We all know the expression backstabbing. Friends, this is where a gossip brings Bad, this is where a gossiper brings bad news about someone behind their victim's back. And they are victims. This characteristic of gossip reveals the hidden and sly nature of gossip. The stealthy, sly nature. A gossiper will drop their voice. A bunch of octave labels. They will look around and then gossip the good news. The Bible uses the word whisperer to describe the secret, secreted nature of the gossiper. Solomon said, like the north wind that brings unexpected rain is a sly tongue, which provokes a horrified look. Going back to King David who said, whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart I will not tolerate. So before, friends, before we drop our voices and take a look around to see who's there, maybe we should ask ourselves these questions. Would I be telling this story if he or she would be here? Why or why not? Am I hiding this conversation from anyone? Am I ashamed of it? Would I want someone else to talk this way about me when I was not there? Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 16, verse 17, said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out, th watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving the Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the mind of naive people. Number three, our third angle is out of a bad heart. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, we see the story and the events surrounding uh, Jesus and his encounter with the Pharisees. Jesus had just uh, healed a demon-possessed man who had been blind and mute, and the Pharisees accused Jesus of working together with Satan. In other words, being empowered by Satan to do such a miracle. And of course, time does not allow us today to deal with this thoroughly as it should be. The point for our purposes is this. In this uh, uh, gospel, Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, uh, Jesus teaches us from this encounter that all the words that we speak, good or bad, comes from the good or evil that is in our hearts. Jesus said a good man brings up good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. I have a notes here, you know, I'll give you an illustration, but we don't have the time for that. Something that happened in my life, but uh, I'm sure you can think of some of those things in your own life. So a good question to ask ourselves uh, regarding our bad hearts sometimes, or out of a bad heart, I mean. Um, why are we tantalized by gossip? Why does it tantalize? Why do we gossip? Why do we listen to gossip? We go back to the book of wisdom, Proverbs Chapter 17, verse 4, which tells us that a wicked person listens to deceitful li lips, a liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. 
We've all heard the expression, uh, birds of a feather stick together. Why do we gossip or listen to gossip? Why do we allow those nasty, tasty morsels into our hearts? Friends, all of us, you and me, every person on this planet, are drawn to participate in evil. It is our sinful nature to do so. It is our sinful desire to do so. Oh, we can come across as holy and righteous when we say, Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? They cheated on their spouse with so-and-so. I wouldn't ever do that. See, friends, sooner or later, the true motivations of our hearts, hearts will come out in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. And so here are some more questions. And these ones to examine our motivations. Why am I saying this? Are these words loving toward the person I am talking about? Friends, when we backstab someone with our gossip in order to get our revenge or for any malicious intent, it is burst in our desire to do evil against that person. Of all the ways that gossip can ne negatively impact, and it's a myriad of ways that can impact a person or community, this desire to do evil and use gossip will threaten to destroy whole communities. We see this in the world around us. We've seen this in churches before and can happen even in our church. Paul, so Paul was dealing with this function in the Corinthian church and he said to them, For I am afraid that when I come I may not find you as I want you to be and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Question. Question to consider. Is there ever a time, is there ever a time when we can talk about someone else when they are not present? Again, always consider the motivation of our hearts. Are there times when we can speak about other people when they're not present? Yes, especially, for example, when we call the police about a crime we have witnessed, that's a good example, or we're seeking counsel, marital counseling, pastoral counseling, whatever kind of counseling, on how to relate to someone in our lives, you know, our spouses, our work, etc. And maybe we know someone who's dangerous, very dangerous in all sorts of ways. Paul reminds us of this, that we can talk about this to someone else, in a second letter to Timothy, Paul said, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. You too should be on your guard against him. He didn't say go and attack him. He didn't go say gossip about him. He said just be on your guard. Now this has been a lot of, I think, very strong time for us, a very intensive time. And I suppose there some of us are really struggling right now, maybe, maybe not. The question is, is there any hope? Is there any hope for us when we yield to the very common and dangerous sin of gossip? One short answer, yes. You see, the motivations of our heart, hearts can be good and loving. We can decide to speak the truth with a loving intention. And when we talk about bad news, the bad news of others, we can do so with the motivation for their good, for their restoration. We can speak to others and bring hope into their lives. And we should learn this very important grammar lesson. The word no is a complete sentence. No, we don't have to be a gossiper. No, we don't have to be a gossiper. Paul reminds us of what, we should, what, we sh what should be our hope and our great comfort concerning the sin of gossip or any other sin for that matter. For Paul said, no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. You might ask, Pastor, what do I do when I have gossiped? Well, I'll present to you what I call the four R's. The first R, repent. Repent. Apostle Peter said to the onlookers in that 
First few days after Pentecost, he said, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out at times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent. Repent, for you have sinned not only against the person you have gossiped about, but you have sinned against a holy and righteous God, who, which is a greater, greater and deeper thing than ever. So repent. To report. Report. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Repent, report, restore. Our motivation from our hearts should be to restore the relationships we have poisoned and broken with our gossip. First, by asking for forgiveness from those we have victimized with our bad reports, our slander, and our lies. And to do anything we can, if possible, to restore and reconcile our relationships. That is our responsibility. Repent, report, restore, and then last, but certainly not least, refresh. See, in a perfect world, everything would turn out as we hoped. Obviously, we do not live in a perfect world. Peter has reminded us as Christians, whenever we have sinned against another person, we have sinned against God first. Any sin we commit is a greater sin to God, is a greater offense to God, who is holy and perfect. If it's not possible to restore a relationship with someone we have damaged by our gossip, there really is nothing more we can do except pray and hope that one day things will be resolved. For Peter did say that if we repent of our sins against God, our sins will be wiped out by God. And this comes with a promise from God himself that there will be times of refreshing to come and come and come from God to each of us. So repent, report, restore, and refresh. And uh, sort of to surround this with the most important thing of all, remember the gospel of Jesus Christ is our resource for all our lives and relationships, including when we slip into the common and dangerous sin of gossip. There's something that I've been using now for a while, for a few months. It's in Job chapter 27, if you want to turn there. Job chapter 27. And uh, it's become not my mantra, but it's been something I have uh, in my whiteboard in my office at the armories, in my office here at the church. It reminds me of my motivation as a follower of Jesus Christ. My, it reminds me of my relationships with people. It reminds me of my boundaries as a pastor and my, where I begin and where I end. It reminds me of when I need to step aside and let someone else take over. It reminds me of all these things, but mostly reminds me of how I want to worship my God the rest of my days. Especially when I consider how easy it is for me to sin and even to slip into gossip. Chapter 27, verse 3 to 6. Job said, As long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit you are right till I die. I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let it go. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. Father, we thank you. First of all, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. You sent into this world who lived died, was resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And from there we have the cross where we can take our sin and we can be forgiven and restored and we can be refreshed by you, Lord. Help us in our relationships, Lord. If we have damaged someone with our gossip, give us the courage, first of all, to do something about it. Second of all, to repent to you and to those we have hurt and to ask for restoration and reconciliation. 
O Lord, the church, of all, the church of Jesus Christ of all places should be known for its honesty and its integrity and character. And we know in so many places it is not. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and we ask for your courage. And we thank you for your word and your spirit that will help us each and every day. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. Shalom.